Cyberspace Cybersecurity Cybercrime Cyberpunk Cyber this, cyber that We've all heard the prefix cyber at many points in our lives But how many of us have actually stopped and wondered Where does this prefix come from? The answer, it turns out, is pretty interesting. It comes from a forgotten science. A peculiar, transdisciplinary subject whose core theory dissolves the boundaries between scientific departments and whose principles and history are just as fascinating as what might lie ahead in its future. This is cybernetics. Our story begins with the legend himself, Isaac Newton, a mathematician, physicist, philosopher and alchemist to whom we contribute the formulation of classical Newtonian mechanics. In Newtonian mechanics, physical systems are modeled as particles with certain positions in space and with certain masses. The time rate of change of a particle's position gives us its velocity. The product of the mass and the velocity gives us the momentum. Knowing all the positions and momenta of a system, along with forces which may act as to change the momentum, you can predict where a system will be, and by flipping the velocities, where a system was. Here, the laws of physics, such as the conservation laws, are indifferent to whether you evolve the system forward or backwards in time. This is called time reversal symmetry. And it is not strictly true. To understand why, we'll have to wait two more centuries after Newton for the arrival of three great men. Ludwig Boltzmann, Willard Gibbs and James Clark Maxwell. All three of them gave birth to a new kind of physics called statistical mechanics. Unlike the systems investigated under Newtonian mechanics, which were very simple, involving a practically countable number of particles, those studied by the statistical physicists were complex. Take the example of a gas. You cannot possibly know all the positions and momenta of the individual particles that make up the gas. So what do you do? You speak instead of macroscopic properties, such as temperature, volume, pressure, etc. However, these properties are only averages taken over the probability distribution of different possible microscopic properties. Let me explain. If we consider a conservative dynamical system consisting of n particles, the positions and momenta of the particles at any given instant of time represents a particular state of the system. The set of all such possible states, or of all possible positions and momenta, represents the so-called phase space of the system. If you plot the phase space onto a graph and assign a probability to the different possible states, you end up with a probability distribution, from which you can deduce how the system will behave. But here comes the interesting part. If you let the phase space evolve and watch what happens to the probabilities as time passes, you observe a single quantity that almost always increases, but never decreases. This quantity is called entropy. Ludwig Boltzmann defined entropy as the natural logarithm of the number of possible states, assuming all are of equal probability. This is in the discrete case. In the continuous case, it is the logarithm of the volume of phase space. The larger the volume, or the more states a system can be in, the higher the entropy. If the probabilities for different states are different, and the system is not in a state of equilibrium, then it will drive towards equilibrium, equalizing the probabilities and increasing the entropy. This will cause the gas to, say, diffuse through the medium in which it is in and the probability distribution to become more spread out. See, because probabilities 1 and 0 involve a state of complete certainty, 
then you may conceive of entropy as a measure of the amount of uncertainty about a system. As time passes, your uncertainty grows. This law of increasing entropy, of increasing uncertainty or disorder, is the only law in physics that is not time reversal symmetric. This law, in a sense, defines the direction of time from low entropy to high entropy, from past to future. To better understand this difference between the reversible time of Newton and the irreversible time of statistics, I want you to think about astronomy, the oldest of the sciences, as an example. If you try and record the night sky, apply Newton's analysis to the celestial bodies, then play the recording in reverse and do the same, the Newtonian laws wouldn't easily distinguish between the forward and backwards recordings. Things would look pretty much the same. Now try to do this for meteorology, a much more recent science which also studies the heavens above us, but for which the Newtonian paradigm is inadequate and so a statistical analysis is needed. In this case, a reverse recording of the clouds, for example, would seem downright wrong. We would see downdrafts where there should be updrafts, turbulence growing coarser in texture, lightning preceding instead of following the change of clouds, and so on. In reality, even astronomy involves frictional forces that run down, and so it too, in the final analysis, possesses an irreversible character. There is not a single science which conforms to the strict Newtonian pattern. The biological sciences certainly have their full share of one-way phenomena. But it isn't the exact reverse of death, nor is anabolism, the building up of tissues, the exact reverse of catabolism, their breaking down. The division of cells does not follow a pattern symmetrical in time, nor does the union of germ cells to form a fertilized ovum. The individual is an arrow pointed through time in one way, and the race is equally directed from the past into the future. Our next stop in the history and theory of cybernetics takes us to the year 1948, in the Bell Telephone Laboratories. Here, a mathematician of the name of Claude Shannon was concerned about the engineering problems of communication, and more specifically, how does one achieve reliable communication over an unreliable channel? In thinking about this, he was led to publish the extremely influential paper titled a mathematical theory of communication. Although Shannon was mainly focusing on the workings of the telegraphs and telephones at the time, it turned out that he solved a much more general problem and in doing so became known as the father of information theory. In his paper, he conceived of communication as the transmission of information from a source to a destination and through a medium called the channel. From mouth to ear and the medium is air. From eye to brain and the medium is cytoplasm. From phone to phone and the medium is a copper wire. If you're old fashioned, that is. On the side of the source there is the transmitter a type of transducer, meaning an input-output device that transforms one type of energy into another and in this case encodes the information into the medium as a signal. On the other side there is the receiver, again a transducer, this time decoding the signal out of the medium as the original information. This information could be a single message or a sequence of messages distributed in time. It could also be a continuous function of time, or perhaps something more complex, like an array of multiple streaming messages, discrete or continuous. Let's consider the simplest case of a single message. How would we to measure the amount of information contained in that message? And really, what is information? Well, a single message is usually one out of a number of possible messages. If all are equally probable, then the amount of information contained in the message is equal to the logarithm of the number of possible messages. 
the base is usually taken as two, a binary digit or a bit, the basic unit of information. You're probably wondering, doesn't this sound familiar? The answer is yes. In fact, when Shannon was thinking how he should call the missing information when a message was yet to be received, he got a suggestion from John von Neumann. Why not call it entropy? Sure, entropy had its thermodynamic interpretations, however, it is not like all physical quantities. It is a statistical one. It depends both on the physical system itself and on your state of knowledge about that system. Or really, the lack of it. The more entropy a system has, the more information I would gain from observing that system. Information then is to be defined as that which resolves uncertainty. Now, when a signal travels through a medium, it acquires noise, the message gets corrupted and information is lost. The role of the receiver is to recover the original message by inferring it from the noise. The process which loses information is analogous to that which gains entropy. It becomes especially evident when we consider quantum mechanics. Here, the fundamental particles themselves are probability distributions described by a wave function. The entanglement of the wave function of the message with that of the surrounding environment involves the fusion of regions of probability and, on average, the loss of information and increase in entropy. The rate of this increase corresponds to the capacity for a given channel to transmit information. Now, in cases where we are on the receiving side, observing or recording the information generated by a source, we produce what is called a time series. The temperature as recorded by a continuous recording thermometer, or the closing potations of a stock in the stock market taken day by day, or the rapidly changing sequences of voltages in a streaming circuit, are all examples of time series. A time series may contain all the statistical information about the past and present of a system and it can be used as to predict its future. Keep in mind that due to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, no amount of information about the past or present is sufficient enough to perfectly predict the future. The nature of time, then, is not only irreversible, but also indeterminate. Before I get into the core of what cybernetics is, there's just one more stop we need to make. In the early 1920s, the German mathematician David Hilbert put forward a new proposal for the foundation of classical mathematics which has come to be known as Hilbert's program. It calls for a formalization of all of mathematics in axiomatic form, together with the proof that this axiomatization is consistent. This proposal resulted in many mathematicians rigorously trying to put the subject on a firm ground. The culmination of the event was the publication of two theorems in 1931 by the mathematician Kurt Gödel. Both of these, called Gödel's incompleteness theorems, were shown to prove that any formal system that was able to produce basic arithmetic is going to contain certain statements, which are true, but are unprovable within the system. The theorems are complex, however, the underlying logic has to do with the paradox of self-reference. The tremendous insights brought by Gödel shook the very core of logic and mathematics and, to a degree, rendered Hilbert's program impossible. However, thinking about these ideas, another young mathematician, Alan Turing, restated the problem in terms of which functions are computable and which are uncomputable. In the distinguishing between the two, he sought to build a universal machine which was able to perform all of the possible computable functions. This was the Turing machine, the predecessor of the modern computer. 
To understand what a computer is and how it works, I want you to consider a simple 1-bit message, i.e. a system having two possible states. A computation is simply a transformation of one state into another. In the case of the 1-bit message, this would be called a NOT gate. Other such gates, corresponding to different logical operations, can be built, and those can be modulated and abstracted to form arithmetic operations, which can be performed on numbers represented by arrays of bits. If you combine all the logical and arithmetic operations into a single unit, you end up with an ALU. The ALU works with something called combinational logic, meaning that as soon as it receives an input, it spits out the output. Contrast this with what is called sequential logic, where information can be processed only at certain discrete intervals of time, specified by an internal clock. Such a device is the register used to store information. Equip the ALU with a few of these registers and you've got yourself a central processing unit, or a CPU. Put a bunch of registers together and you've got yourself a memory unit. In the classical von Neumann architecture of a computer, the CPU reads instructions from the memory, which tell it what and how to read and write into the memory, while the whole system interacts with peripheral devices which are mapped onto the memory. By the way, you can think of memory as simply the transmission of information temporally rather than spatially through a stable physical system. Finally, we have arrived at a point where enough has been said on some of the intellectual background around which cybernetics was built, and I can now take you to the birthplace of it, where it all began. In the early 1940s, many of the greatest scientists, because of the war, had to be evacuated to a neutral country to work in peace. A spectrum of different academic disciplines were sent to work at the Clinic of Neurophysiology in Mexico City, headed by Dr. Arturo Rosenblut, one of the leading brain experts at the time. Within the group of scientists was Norbert Wiener. Considered the founding father of cybernetics, Wiener was a world authority in mathematics, specializing in the field of harmonic analysis. As the story goes, Rosenblut, Wiener and all the other scientists sent to the clinic formed a sort of club at night, where they would gather around and talk about some topic. They soon, however, stumbled upon the fact that their vocabularies had been heavily compartmentalized by their respective fields and so had trouble choosing a topic that everybody could talk about. After thinking for a while, they chose the topic of control. Still, they took an ear to interpret to each other what each one of them thought the concept of control meant. For the astrophysicist it was one thing, for the linguist or anthropologist another. They all had different notions of control, yes, but after a few years going at it, talking at this club, little by little, they realized they're onto something, and that they may have stumbled across a new science, made out of universal principles of control. One of the most astonishing moments came one evening when Wiener was sitting in the common room. An electrical engineer entered to talk to Wiener about a device he had an idea about that would enable blind people to read with their ears. Wiener said, all right then, explain it to me, and so the engineer started scribbling a diagram of the device. His idea was to use photoelectric cells to scan a page of print through time and translate the shape of the letters into different pitches of sound. The engineer drew, they discussed the idea, and after a while, he left, leaving the diagram sitting on the table. Not long after, Dr. Von Bonin, entering the room to get something, saw the schematic, picked it up, and asked Wiener, who was also there, who drew a diagram of the fourth layer of the visual cortex? Chills went through Wiener's body as he heard this. Later, he explained to the club what had happened and they all started trying to figure out the connection. Wiener, the mathematician, proceeded to quantify the diagram. He said, this thing is going to have a scanning rhythm, a rate with which all the pulses are coming in. After doing the calculations, he ended up with the answer 10 cycles per second. It turned out that this was precisely the alpha rhythm of the brain, 
the resting state of the brain. Acting as some kind of an internal clock, this rhythm synchronizes all the impulses going through the system, like the clock of a computer. Building on many analogies quite like this one, Wiener eventually published his book Cybernetics, or Control and Communication in the Animal and the Machine. I already spoke about communication, but now, what is control? Perhaps most central to the topic of control is the notion of feedback. Feedback occurs when a system's output is coupled back to its input. In this way, any disturbances coming into the system, which would cause its variables to fluctuate, are fed back into the system, being either added or subtracted from the input. The former case, called positive feedback, tends to amplify disturbances, while the latter, called negative feedback, tends to reduce disturbances and therefore stabilize the system. Negative feedback is especially important as it serves as a basis for autonomy. Let me explain. One of the simplest examples of a negative feedback system is a thermostat. You set the thermostat to a certain temperature. The thermostat measures the temperature of the room and if it is below the desired level, it heats up the room. If it is above the desired level, it cools the room down, and so on. Of course, the feedback must come in small and steady increments, so not to send the temperature of the room into a violent oscillation. Another negative feedback mechanism is the governor of a watt steam engine, which serves to regulate its velocity under varying conditions of load. It consists of two balls attached to a rod and swinging on opposite sides of a rotating shaft. The balls are kept down by their own weight, while at the same time are sprung upward by a centrifugal force dependent on the angular velocity. The balls thus assume a compromised position between the balance of these two forces. Now, the balls are connected to a ring which serves to open and close the intake valves of the engine. If the engine speeds up, the balls rise and close the valves, and if it slows down, the balls fall and open the valves. Thus, the feedback tends to oppose what the system is already doing. The process which brings the system out of control is the very same process which brings it back into control. You can see, there are feedbacks to stabilize temperature, feedbacks to stabilize velocity, even for position there is, as in an automatically controlled aircraft. Our own body, in fact, contains a bunch of these, which are collectively known as our homeostatic mechanism. The conditions under which life in the higher animals can continue are very narrow. That's why it needs an assembly of feedbacks to keep parameters such as temperature, blood pressure, heart rate, hydrogen ion concentration and so on within strict limits. In the nervous system we also find a type of negative feedback called voluntary feedback. If I want to move my hand to grab something, for example, I do it so as to reduce the distance between the position of my hand and the position of the object I want to grab. For this to happen, I have to efficiently monitor the current position of my hand back to my central nervous system in order to produce a proportioned output and to set a new position, which is then taken again as input. In a certain disease called alaxia, the chain for the transmission of information received from the senses is damaged, and so the feedback is damaged, which causes the person having this disease to swing their arm past the object they want to grab, again and again, going into an oscillation. Our voluntary feedback, by which we regulate the performance of a task through the observation of the amount by which it has not yet been achieved, needs the backing of other feedbacks. These are called postural feedbacks and are associated with the general maintenance of the tone of the muscular system. There are numerous more examples of both positive and negative feedback, in ecology, in economics. However, I'll leave those for you, the viewer, to find out about. For now, I want to end this section with one particular example of feedback. The steering of a ship. A steersman fixes his eyes on a far-off position and drives the ship towards it. If he is thrown off course, he steers the ship so as to make it align with the line of action directed towards the chosen position. 
It's a negative feedback that stabilizes position, and it's quite similar in nature to our voluntary feedback. Why am I telling you about this? Because the Greek word for the steersman of a ship is Kubernetes. The same word from which we get cybernetics. Absurdly close to the field of cybernetics is the field of artificial intelligence. It too is built on technological analogies to the nervous system and the brain. For example, the perceptron, an artificial neuron, was created in 1958 by Cornell University psychologist Frank Rosenblatt. This perceptron performed the weighted sum on an array of input signals and then compared the output to something called the bias. If the output was bigger than the bias, the perceptron fired, giving us a 1. If it was smaller than the bias, it didn't fire, and so this meant a 0. By being shown different images, where the values of the pixels were taken as input, the perceptron was able to learn to distinguish between two categories of objects. In the 80s, researchers at Carnegie Mellon used a similar method to create one of the first self-driving cars. The way they did it is by using the perceptron to construct an artificial neural network which consisted of an input layer, visual sensors around the car, a hidden layer, and an output layer that told the vehicle on how to steer. The output of the car was compared to the output of a driver who was sitting inside in order to calculate an error. The weights of the network, initially set at random, were adjusted after every iteration so as to reduce the error and better match the driver's output. This was one of the first examples of machine learning. In the animal too, a similar type of learning, learning through experience, is present and it's called ontogenetic learning. Ontogenetic learning is usually distinguished from phylogenetic learning, i.e. learning through self-reproduction and random variation. Any learning or self-reproducing automata is a form of self-organizing system, which requires a non-linear feedback to function. Every organism on the planet presents itself as such a system. At every level of organization, every tissue, every cell, the level of intercommunication between the elements determines the degree to which the whole has agency. This can be seen clearly in ant or termite colonies. In human society too, the level of intercommunication through the medium of language determines the agency and or autonomy of the society. If that's the case, consider what might happen when the bandwidth of communication becomes exceptionally high. There are many new technologies developed by different companies which may serve as catalysts to this increase. New sensories vest and bracelet, quite similar to the reading device I spoke of earlier, can transform all sorts of data, primarily sound, into patterns of vibration on your skin, adding or replacing a sense. Meta's bracelet can monitor the nerve impulses going through your hand and use them to type on a device. Or the Big Boy in Town, Neuralink, a brain-computer interface which aims, first, to cure brain and spinal cord injuries, and second, to merge humans with artificial intelligence. Will these neural interfaces act as some sort of a gateway to a hive mind society? Or to the metaverse, perhaps? Will the holistic discipline of cybernetics make a comeback due to the need for a better understanding of these technologies? Will man merge with machine, or will machine take over the privileged position of man? Perhaps only time will tell. Until then, keep steering.